Welcome to Global Perspectives. Are truth and reconciliation possible within societies? What about between societies? For answers, we turn to Naomi Tutu, who has a truly global perspective on this issue. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Naomi. Thank you. Talk to us about the issue of truth and reconciliation and what has become an increasingly confrontational and, and coarse world. Are, are we you know, blowing into the wind on this one or, or is it the right time to be engaging in this conversation? I think when times are most difficult are probably the best times to be starting on, on a process like this. Um, that it is when conflict and opposition are at its highest that we actually need the courageous people to start the conversation around truth and reconciliation. Because if you look at the South African context, um, that when the TRC started there, there was um, opposition to it on, on both ends. So there was the, the sense from many in the white community that the TRC was simply going to be a witch hunt looking for what white South Africans had done during a bar date. And in, in, and in the black community, there was a sense that it was just a way of, a wishy-washy way of dealing with, with the, the, the atrocities that had happened under a bar date. And the very process itself of having those conversations going on, supported by our government in that context, but those having those conversations, having a whole a commission, started the process of South Africans also talking to one another about what that experience of apartheid was and how it continued to impact us in a post-apartheid South Africa. So I think this is probably the perfect time to be having those conversations. But in, in South Africa, this did not happen quickly. It took a mm -hmm. long, long time for people to go through this process. Mm -hmm. Did they become more convinced on both sides that the process was working? I think that people did. I mean, you know, I when I talk to people about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I there are a couple of things that I share. So the the one is that leading into the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, my father was probably one of the hate, most hated men, uh, particularly you know, in, 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 in white South Africa. And that um, a few years into the process, there was a, a, a radio show call in and they asked people to name um, the two most popular people that they, that they could think of. And in fact, one of the starting f statements from the, the radio station was, you cannot choose Nelson Mandela or Desmond Tutu. And I think that that was part of the, the results of the process, that people saw that it was indeed a process about healing. And, um, and, and, and the, the other story that I share is of attending one of the hearings and at the hearing, they actually read a letter from a young white South African who was not a perpetrator, was not a victim or a survivor, who wrote a letter to the commission saying, thank you for this commission and apologizing too. He said that, you know, I did not know what was going on in our country. I didn't know the levels of torture. I didn't know the amount of abuse. I didn't know about the murders. And he said, but I also recognize that I chose not to know and that what the TRC has brought to me is an awareness of how important it is that we hear and tell the true stories of our, our country and our community, and, and that this is my pledge, is that I will make sure that no child of mine will ever find themselves in a place where they say, I did not know. And so I, I really do think that just being in the process and having the opportunity to, to hear people's stories, to hear how apartheid impacted them, to hear even from the perpetrators how they justified what it was that they were doing, um, that all of that was an important part of the healing process for South Africa. Well, you, you've studied international affairs, you've studied <laughs> divinity, you've studied psychology, you've studied so many things. Too many things. <laughs> what is it in 
the human being that mm -hmm. leads some to think it's entirely okay to subjugate other people. And we've been dealing with this since the beginning of organized society, and we're dealing mm -hmm. with it today. Mm -hmm. is, is there something fundamentally wrong in certain people, or is it taught behavior, learned behavior? See, uh, that is one thing that I also came away with from the TRC, is that you know it was initially it was very easy for us to point at the individual perpetrators and say what terrible people they must be. But in the process, we also heard their stories. We heard about them being parents and spouses and neighbors and members of their church and, and all around good people except for this dark part of their lives where they served as, as torturers, as murderers. Um, and, and so that for me made it clear that it is not about some individual who is born evil. Um, in most cases, it is the opportunity that we give people for either their dark or their light side to, to dominate. And I think that as communities and countries, that we can come up with ways that, that ensure that we don't put people in positions where they have absolute control and power over other people. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more because that seems to be the formula for mm -hmm. the disasters that, that we've seen in the past and continue to see in many places and today. And I think that it is easy, it is much easier for us if we can say there are these evil people out there who do these evil things. And, and I think that that is the human, the initial response is, you know, yes, they must be terrible, terrible people. and. And I think that that is a way of actually bailing out of our responsibility for making our world a more just place. That if it were that simple, then we could see the people who are likely to be torturers or murderers, that there would be something on their forehead, on their ears, or some, some part of their anatomy that let us know that this is definitely an evil person. But the reality is that we have seen it in this country. I mean, most, you know, Banali, if you like, is the, the, the experiment of the, with the students as, as prisoners and, and guards, that they knew they were in an experiment. They knew this was not real life. They knew these were their classmates, and yet had been given absolute power over the lives of, of their people in an experiment, not the enemy, not somebody who has committed a crime, somebody who you go to class with that the, the, the temptation to be abusive and oppressive was so high that they had to end the experiment early. So I think that what that teaches us is that there is that potential in all of us. And if we want to lessen that, we as a society, as a world, have to come up with systems that ensure that we don't tempt people into the places of, of their darkness. So is part of the solution to start with education very, very early mm -hmm. so that there isn't time for these forces of darkness to emerge? Mm -hmm. I think education is important. Um, and when I say education, I'm thinking about education writ large, not, what, not necessarily what we are simply teaching in schools. Um, but it is a, a, a societal effort that is, is needed. And for me, the, the funda there, there are two fundamental teachings that I think are important for us if we are to avoid that kind of, that, that kind of evil. And one is that to recognize the humanity of all people, to, to teach our young people that when you look at another human being, the first thing you need to recognize is that you are looking at another human being. Um, and, and I know that sounds like such a simple thing, 
but if we, you know, we, we only have to listen to how people describe others to know that they are not starting from a place of this is another human being, that they are starting from a place of this is, uh, you know, this is a, 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 a danger to me. This is a person who doesn't agree with me. This is an enemy. This is a suspicious person. So, so for me, that's the first teaching that we need to be doing. And the second teaching can almost be seen as the opposite of that. And that is to also say that we are all different and that we come into our communities, into our organizations, our schools, our universities, bringing differences. We bring racial, ethnic, gender, ability. We bring all kinds of differences. And if we are going to be people who value justice, we have to recognize those differences as being necessary for the health of our communities, rather, those, rather than seeing those differences as threats to the health of our communities. And, and it seems to me then, if we are able to put aside the fear mm -hmm. and focus on what is beneficial about those differences, mm -hmm. then perhaps we can move forward in a more harmonious fashion, but it's never easy. In South Africa, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established a long time ago. Many years have passed. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelson Mandela returned, served his time, and, and he too is, is, is gone. gone. And South Africa is still not where we had hoped it would be. But these mm -hmm. things take, in some cases, generations. Generations. And I, I definitely, you know, I think that we all hope that there will be some miracle somewhere in the world. And, and people spoke about South Africa as a miracle. And the, the truth is that there, it's unlikely to, for there to be a miracle. There are people who lived in apartheid, who were um, brainwashed into the thinking of apartheid, of, of the divisions and the hatred and the suspicions of one another. And as much work as something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission can do, as much as one human being in uh, Nelson Mandela can be a model, as much as you can write laws and, um, and, and, and change the structure of, of government, that it takes the, the process of, of, allow, of, of educating, um, if you like, people about living peacefully and justly in a, in a diverse community is, is not an easy thing. You know, it is easier, I, I think, to tell people that if you have a problem, it is because of that person there or those people there, or, rather than say that if we have a problem as a country or as a community, we need to come together as a country and community and find ways of solving this problem. It's much easier to point out that is the cause of our problem. And if we only keep out those people or oppress those people or, or imprison those people, then everything will be fine. When the hard work, as you say, the hard work is the work of saying, how do we, starting from a place of, of our shared humanity, take our differences and use them as gifts to deal with the problems that we have in our society? So wh why don't you use yourself as an example? Y you've been wise as long as I've known you, but at one time, <laughs> You were young, like we, we all are at some point, and we've talked about our children and how they don't tend to regard their parents as being that well-informed. But mm -hmm. you had two very, very strong role models in your parents. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that helped shape your personal views and your worldviews. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that for me, the, the, my parents gave me a couple of wonderful, wonderful gifts. And the first was that they, and not just they, because my grandparents were the same way and many of my teachers um, and the community that surrounded me in church too, were very clear that they, they, they saw me as somebody of, as a gift, 
and that they saw all the children in our community as a gift and that there was that there was something in each of us that was worth um, cultivating and encouraging and it was not the same thing in all of us but that they always saw us as individuals and as 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 people who brought something into the relationship, even as children. So, um, so in, in, in my family, we, we were constantly being challenged and encouraged at the same time, challenged to, to, to live into the great people that our parents, like, you know, all parents think their children are gonna be great. But I mean, my parents really did, did see it as a challenge that you, that you have to then look at what are your gifts and also look at what are your faults and how do you enhance the one and, 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 and work against the other and that that was part of their role to challenge and, and also to encourage. So that was, that was one. And, and the other gift was the, our exposure to a wide range of people. Um, so I, I always talk about, so I was exposed to my grandmothers who were both domestic workers and exposed to members of the community of the resurrection, a, 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 a priestly order in the Anglican communion who were amazing thinkers and, and people of great humility. Um, I was exposed to um, student activists um, like Bani Pichane, like Stephen Biko, that my parents were always give, showing us what people are doing in the world. And, and also fortune, through fortune that they were able to, to leave South Africa and travel, also given the opportunity to experience life outside of apartheid. And all of those experiences, I think, are what uh, what gave me hope um, and continue to give me hope in, in our world that you, when we look around, we can, it is easy to see the, the things that cause pain and anger, the things that make us afraid for the future of our world. But the gift that my parents gave me is to look for the signs of hope. Um, and, and for me, sometimes the signs of hope are something as small as one of my children wanting to know more about the history of South Africa and how that ties in with their experiences in this country and how that ties in with the, the whole of the world and, and the African continent. So that just a young person believing that there is something in history that will teach them, to me, is a sign of hope. Um, the fact that we have young people who look at our world and rather than throwing up their hands in dismay and, and saying to us older generation, well, you certainly made a mess out of this, but rather saying, okay, we're in a mess. How do we, what can we do to make this different? How do we speak to one another? How do we challenge systems of power and privilege? How do we empower those who don't have power? How do we open up the space for new voices? All of that to me is finding the hope even in the darkest times. Well, let's take it down to the individual level. Let's say mm -hmm. you're sitting down with someone who is the opposite of everything you've just described and yet mm -hmm you have to start a conversation with that person. You have mm -hmm. to begin building a bridge because otherwise the mm -hmm. situation could be very problematic. Mm -hmm. How do you start? How do you make an attempt to reach out to someone who may appear to be unreachable? My approach is always to ask somebody to tell their story. That I find that when you give somebody the space and the attention that I see you 
Um, and I, I, I always say to people that for me, starting the conversation, it's actually wonderful that in, in, in some of our languages, such as Zulu, that when you start, when you first see somebody, you say Saubona, which means I see you. And so for me, that is the way to start a conversation with somebody who is so different, is to start by saying, I see you. And I am interested in hearing who you are and how you came to be who you are. The, the angriest people I find are people who feel as though no one has heard their story. No one cares to hear their story. Um, and, 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 and so then it is easy to find um, fault with the world or with some part of the world. And so I think that it is important on an individual level to be willing to sit and share stories. Um, and there is, there is, you know, there's nothing rocket science-y about that. It is just a fundamental human need to be seen and, and, and recognized and dealt with as a human being. And I, I like to, to share in terms of that, the story of you know, the gunman who took, um, who took the, gun, the, the school in Atlanta. And what was so different in that story from other stories we have heard is that that woman in the office who sat and talked to him and asked about him and cared about him and, and let him know that she cared about him. And, you know, it would have been easy for her in that place of fear to simply shut down herself, shut him out, and simply label him as a problem, a terrorist, whatever. And yet she had the humanity to see a human being. And oftentimes that can be the catalyst for a more constructive outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, what about people who are still unreachable after you try all of those things? Mm -hmm. Is there some point at which you say, well, I throw up my hands, or do you come back on another day and try again? I, I have to say that I am one who says there are some points where you just have to say, okay, this is not my battle to do. This, this is way above my pay grade, and I'm going to hope that there is somebody else out there who can deal with that. Because, um, you, and, and I say that because I, I have found that there are many young people who attempt to be in conversations and then when it doesn't work, are uh, hard on themselves. That, you know, was there some magic thing that I missed in, 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 in reaching out to this person? I tried to reach out and all they came back at me with was racist and sexist language and stereotypes. And so is there something about the way I approach them that is wrong? And I always say that there are some people who are so happy in their anger and bitterness that there is nothing that you can do that will move them from there. But I think that that is actually a very small proportion of our world's community, that most people are seeking community. But if you do come up against somebody who cannot respond to acts of compassion and empathy, then I think that for your own sanity and your ability to, to carry on the struggle another day, you have to be able to say, okay, I tried. And, there is, and at this point, I must walk away for my own sanity and my own ability to come to continue in the struggle for justice. We're running a bit short on time, but I okay. wonder if you could just tell us, um, in light of everything we've just discussed, are you optimistic about the future of South Africa and are you optimistic about the future of our world? And I would have to say yes. I would have to say yes because um, in, so in the South African context, I would have to say yes because I think that I am seeing in South Africa the, all over the country, people 
questioning the direction of our country and, and saying, you know, we started on a path and we, maybe we have lost our way in some areas on that path and, and we need to have a leadership that is responsive to the people of the country. So yes, I am optimistic in South Africa and I'm optimistic in the world because I look around the world and I see young people who say, this cannot be the world that we pass on to those who come after us and we are going to do all that we can to make it a better place. And so, yes. Good. Well, on that note, thank you, Naomi Tutu, thank for joining you. us today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.